Praise the Lord. I welcome everyone to the Bible study tonight in Jesus' name. What a special time it is today. And thank God you are here. God will do something in your life. It will be a memorable and forgettable time together in Jesus' name. Let's close our eyes for prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we do thank you at this time for your goodness. We thank you because of bringing us here for the Bible study. And we're asking, Lord, that you'll do great things in every life in Jesus' name. And we're asking, Lord, that you open the pages of scriptures to everyone. You give us real understanding. And what we understand, you grant us the grace and the strength to carry out according to your will and be obedient to your word in Jesus' name. We thank you for those who are coming for the first time. We pray you grant them understanding as well and draw them closer to yourself. Bless everyone, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you very much, O Consider. And we're looking at First John chapter 2. For the benefit of those who are coming for the first time, or maybe you've been coming before, but uh, this is your fourth time of coming after some time. We're going through the epistle of John. That's the first epistle of John to the churches. And uh, we've studied chapter 1. We're actually in chapter 2 now. And we're reading from verse 15. In verse 15 it says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away, and the lost thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Come back to verse 15. Love not the world. For those who are reading that for the first time, and for those who might have read it before, but they do not understand the use of the word world. It might come as a surprise to you. Number one, we know that John is the apostle of love. And the apostle of love is writing to the church and is saying, love not even that. Isn't that a contradiction? That a person that is raised up, that is even labeled and called apostle of love, is saying, love not. Not only that, you think about God. It is in this epistle that John makes it very clear by the inspiration of the Spirit of God that God is love. And in fact, it says, if you do not love your brother, then you are in darkness. Because uh, if you do not love, you do not show that the God of love is abiding in you. And surprisingly, this is the John that God used to say, love not the world. Something else surprises us because we know that it's in the gospel according to St. John. In chapter 3 verse 16 it says, For God, tell me the rest, so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He loves the world to the point that he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. It comes then as a surprise to people that the God who so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes will not perish but have everlasting life, is now saying, love not the world. Let me explain to you. God created the world. We will say is the inhabited world. He loves the world he created. But then there are inhabitants in the world. He loves the inhabitants in the world. But then there is also iniquity in the world. The inhabited world, he loves that world because he created that world. And then the inhabitants in the world, he loves them because he created them. That's why he says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And it says, whosoever believes and is baptized shall be saved, and whosoever believes not shall be damned. But now the iniquity in the world is now equated with the world. It's actually talking about, let me put it this way, the people of the world, he loves them. God so loved the world. 
And you remember, it says that Jesus Christ came into this world, the physical world, and the world received him not. Those are the people in the world. And then as many as received him, he gave them the power to become the sons of God. Even those who believe on his name, what John is telling us by inspiration is, for the people of the world, God loves them. But then, there is the prince of this world. His name is Satan. God doesn't love the prince of this world. And then there are policies in the world. God doesn't love that. And then there are pollutions in the world. He doesn't love the pollution of the world. There is perversion in the world. He does not love the perversions in the world. So when he says, love not the world, he's talking about the world, the system in the world, that is controlled by the prince of the power of the air. That's why Jesus said, the prince of this world cometh and has nothing in me. That's why he said another time again, now is the time for judgment. And the prince of this world is judged. It's the prince of the world that develops the system of the world and is the one that gives the pollutions of the world and the perversions of the world and the preoccupation of the world. And so when God looks at that and he says, all these together, we talk like that, we say there's the world of politics. We talk about the world of fashion. We talk about the world of economics. And we talk about the world of fashion. We talk about the world of science. The world of entertainment. That's what the Lord is talking about. He's talking about a system now. And he's saying, you're going to find when you get to that world, apart from the people, you have the politics. Apart from the people, you have the pollutions. Apart from the people, you have the perversion. Apart from the people, you have all their preoccupations. Now he says, love not the world. Neither the things that are in the world. And when he says, neither the things that are in the world, he makes it very clear. It's not talking about the chairs and the buildings and all that. It's not talking about that. It says the things in the world, what are they? It says the lost of the flesh. It makes it very clear. When it's, it's talking about the world, that world is the lost of the flesh. That world is the lost of the eyes and that world is the pride of life. Why would he say don't love that? Uh, the, the journey, if you look at the Bible, it's referring us back to the beginning. Garden of, the Garden of Eden was beautiful. And that was a beautiful world that God gave unto Adam and Eve. And then the serpent came. That serpent was indwelt by Satan. And then that serpent said to Eve, As God said, you should not eat of any of these seeds that you know, is created. And Eve said, No, we can eat. But only this of the tree of uh, you know, good and evil, you will not eat. Ah, Satan, in that serpent said, God knows that when you take up that, you're going to be like God. And then it says, if you remember your Bible, when Eve saw, that's the lost of the flesh now, she saw it was good for her body to be taken. And then the lost of the eyes, he saw that it was even pleasant. And then you will be like God, the pride of life. I will be like God. I will ascend to the very throne of God. I will know what God knows. I will see how God sees. And that's the world. It is that. Those things of the world, loss of the flesh, and the loss of the eyes, and the pride of life, that made, that caused the fall of man, and has gotten us to all the iniquity, and the suffering, and everything. And God is reminding us, do you know what caused the fall of man? And do you know what caused the, all the suffering we're going through now? The loss of the flesh, and the loss of the eyes, and the pride of life. And he wanted, Satan wanted to use the same tree for the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ filled with the Holy Ghost. You remember the story in Matthew chapter 3? And the Holy Ghost came upon him like in the form of a dove. And then the voice of God spoke from heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And then the Spirit led him to the wilderness being tempted of the devil. And what did the devil use? Those three things again. And the devil came and he said, look at this. You are hungry now. You may fasting for 40 days. Why don't you turn these stones to bread? 
the lust of the flesh, the desire of the flesh. When you're hungry, you want to eat, but you don't want to eat in a way that is dictated by the prince of this world. And then Jesus said, it is written, get out of there. And then he came back again and said, he showed him all the things of the world, all the kingdoms and the beauty of them. He said, if you bow down to me, I'll give this to you. And Jesus said, no, only God, the God of heaven, you will watch What's that? That's the lust of the eyes. It showed him all the beauty, all the glory, the lust of the eyes. And it's the same thing that the devil uses today. And eventually he now brought him to the mountain top or the top of a higher building. And he said, you fall down. And you, so that you can demonstrate to the people that you have this power. What's that? That's the pride of life. That if you fall down like that and you'll not hit your foot against a stone, then the people will know that actually you are the king. The same thing. The loss of the flesh and the loss of the eyes and the pride of life. You bring everything together, that's the world that the Lord is talking about here. And it says, love not the world. And the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And then he makes it very clear for all that is in the world. The lust of the flesh and the pride and lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father but is of the world. And then it says, and the world passes away. That is, the world is passing away. Uh, if you look at the world in which we are, whatever the world is, world of entertainment, world of passion, the world of science, and the world of darkness, and the world of occultism, everything is changing, it's passing away. And uh, the originators of those things are passing away to you, and it seems for you to be stable, for you to get to heaven, for you to abide forever, overlook all the things that are passing away, and hold on to the things that will stand. He that doeth the will of God, he shall abide forever. Thank God you are one of those people, you'll abide forever in Jesus' name. Now as you think about all this, number one, it talks about the lust of the flesh. That's a passion, the passion that people have. They, have. they have desires, and those desires, do you see the wrong way? And then he talks about the loss of their eyes. That is what they see, the greed that comes, the covetousness that comes, because you see this, you want to grab it. You see that, you want to grab it. Those are possessions. And then you have the pride of life. I want to rise, sire. I want to be that. I want to be that. And want to compete with the Joneses in the city. That's the position. It's using the passion. It's using the possession. It's using the position to lure men into evil. And the question is, what is your own preoccupation in life? What is it you are running after? Are you running after the things that the Lord has said? Don't run after that. Because he wants you to live forever. And because he wants you to live forever, he wants you to uh, shun all those things of the world. We're going to divide the study to three parts. Number one, God's precept and command against worldliness. God's precept and command against worldliness. Number two, gradual process of corruption by the world. The world is uh, very crafty, and it's, uh, it's a process of uh, being corrupted by the world, gradual process of corruption by the world. And point number three, guided preparation and consecration for the next world. There's another world, there's another kingdom, and thank God you're going to be there. But you need to prepare, and God guides us as to how we're going to inherit that world, the world which is to come, this one will pass away. There's coming another one that will not pass away. Guided preparation and consecration for the next world. Let's come to number one. In number one, we're looking at a God's preset and command against holiness. We're looking at First John chapter 2 verse 15. It says, love not the world. Neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You'll notice here that this, there's no denominational 
a kind of uh, standard in this. And there is no peculiarity to any denomination here. This is not talking about deeper life or talking about that church or this church or that church. It just says, he's been talking to little children. He says, I'm writing to you because your sins are forgiven you. He says, a young man, I'm reaching, writing to you because the word of God abides in you and ye are strong. And then he says, fathers, I write unto you because you have known him that is from the beginning. Now he says, little children and young men and fathers, I'm giving you a message. If you are born again, you have the life of Christ in you. And you have the life of God in you. This is for every believer, the new convert and the growing believer and the elderly ones. He says, love not the world. Now that the things that are in the world. Actually, Jesus Christ told us through his disciples. He says in John chapter 15. John chapter 15. I'm reading here from verse 18. It says in verse 18, In the world hate you. Ye know that it hated me before it hated you. The prince of this world makes um, the people of the world to hate the salvation of Christ and to hate the scriptures that lead us to salvation and to hate the things belonging to God. And Jesus said, The world hates me. And the world will hate you. Look at verse 19. It says, See, ye were of the world, the world will love its own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. The prince of this world then has a plan. The prince of this world has a purpose. And the prince of this world has some power. How does he use his power? He uses his power to fulfill his purpose. What's the purpose? To discourage the people that are following Christ. And to make them go away from Christ. And what are the things he uses? The lust of the flesh. The lust of the eyes and the pride of life. That's why the Lord is saying, you must know that the prince of this world is not happy that you are a Christian, that you are a believer. And he will do whatever he can do to make you get off the way of salvation. And he says, I've chosen you out of the world. The world hates you. Not just the world, because Satan, their master, their lord, and their prince, because he hates you. That's why he motivates them and he, he makes them to hate you. Therefore, do not love the world or the things that are in the world. We're looking at the precept. We're looking at, uh, first, at John chapter 17. John chapter 17. I'm reading from verse 14. It says, I have given them thy word, and the world has hated them. You see, when you come out of darkness, those who are still in darkness will not appreciate your decision. They will not appreciate the fact that now you are converted, you are born again, and a change has come in your life. You receive the word of God, and from that point on, the world has hated them. Because, look at this, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. If he's not of the world, of what uh, country is he? He's of heaven. And if you are not of the world, where do you belong? You belong to the kingdom of God in heaven. And because of that, you love the things of heaven. And you cannot ride two horses going different directions at the same time. You cannot follow Christ and follow Satan at the same time. You cannot follow the kingdom of God and the world to come. And then the world over here, the world of darkness, at the same time, you have to be either on this road or on that road. You have to be riding this horse or riding that other horse. You cannot try those two horses all at the same time, going in different directions. Therefore, if you love the Lord, you not love the world. If you love the Lord, the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh and the pride of life will not be your preoccupation or your, uh, your uh, kind of uh, pursuit. We're looking at Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. We're reading here from verses 1 and 2. Here is what the Lord is telling us concerning uh, the believers, concerning the brethren. He tells us what our attitude ought to be about, about the world. He tells us in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, he yeah, is talking to those and those same people, little children, young men, and fathers. I write unto you. And here it says, I beseech you, I plead with you, therefore, brethren, 
by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Look at verse 2. And be not conformed to this world. Why? Because the system of the world is organized by Satan. Because it's influenced by Satan. Because it's inspired by the prince of this world. The prince, you know, will get to the principalities. Principalities and powers, the same. The prince of this world. And because the world is under the control of Satan. That's why it says, we are God and the whole world lies in the wicked one. And because they lie under the influence and inspiration and all the power of the evil one. That's why it says, if you belong to God, be not conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that she may prove what is that good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. Well, as you look at this, if you are going to understand that verse 15 very well, one, you have to understand the definition of the world. Two, you have to understand the defilement by the world. And three, you need to understand the damnation of the world. Number one is the definition of the world. When it says the world, it's referring to the evil world. It's referring to all the, the sin and the darkness and the occultism and the idolatry and the evil of the world. Look at Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. Here we're reading from verse 4. Galatians chapter 1 and we're reading from verse 4. It says, Who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from... Tell me out loud. You are not there. Galatians chapter 1 verse 4. Have you opened your Bible? Galatians chapter 1 verse 4. It says, Who gave himself our sins that he might deliver us from, tell me now, from this present evil world. Eh, that's the world you says we shouldn't love. Of course, we love the people in the world. We love the sinners. We don't love their sins, but we love them. want to preach the gospel to them. We love the believers, our neighbors in the world. Do unto others as we want them to do. To love your neighbor like yourself. We love our neighbors, but the evil of the world. That's the definition. When it says, love not the world, because he has delivered us from the present evil world. According to the will of God and our Father. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, we're reading from verses 2 and 3. It says, Wherein a time passed, ye walked according to the course of this world. See, the world has a curriculum, the world has a cause. And the world have, they have their training. And the world have their influence. And it says, according to the cause of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. That's how the people of the world, that's how they get their fashion, how they get their entertainment, how they get their inspiration, how they get all the whatever it is they're doing that makes the world the world. And those are the things because of the bad influence, because of the satanic influence, and because of the terrible, devastating influence of Satan on the world. And it says over here, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now walketh in the church children of dis disobedience is the spirit and you can see the spirit that is smooth people you read the newspapers and you can see what people do that when you as you have become a believer you look at this say, why do people do this how can they do this and they do that and you know they, they don't bat an eye and uh, when uh, you know the enforcement officers ask them they just calmly answer and they say I did that because of this and, and they don't even think about the consequence of what they are doing because they are under a spell and they are under a spirit and they are under a motivation and influence that's why the Lord is saying you are not like you are born again you are a child of God little children I'm writing to you and young men I'm writing doesn't the word of God abide in you and you fathers that know him that is from the beginning you cannot love what they love 
Because the spirit that influences you is different from the spirit that is influencing them. The spirit influencing them is the spirit of Satan and the spirit of demons and the spirit of darkness. But the one that is influencing you is the spirit of God and the Holy Spirit is not going to influence you in the same direction. It's the, the devil is influencing all those people. It says in verse 3, among whom ye shine, among among whom also we all had a conversation, a manner of life, a conduct in times past, in the lust of the flesh. You see that it says, it's because of that influence that the lust of the flesh, and then fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Look at verse 4, but God. That's what makes a difference in your life. But God, it becomes your father. And Jesus becomes your savior. And the blood of Jesus Christ washes you whiter than snow. And now you're different. And the things I used to do, I do them no more. The places I used to go, I go there no more. The things I used to desire, I used to embrace, I desire them no more. I embrace them no more because God came into my heart, into my life. And that makes a difference. There's a difference in your life. I said there's a difference in your life. But God who is rich in mercy for his great love where we is, he loved us even when we were dead in sins as quickened us together with Christ. By grace are ye saved. Now you know the description of the world. You know the, uh, you know the definition of the world. Number two is the defilement by the world. The defilement by the the world. Why is the Lord saying love not the world? None of the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in it because the world will defile you. And we even have uh, sometimes, uh, you know, if you think about even the ordinary life, ordinary world, you wake up in the morning and you wash yourself and you're very clean, and you look neat, and then you go on the road. Not that you mixed with any dust or whatever, and you know, you go to a clean office and all that, and then you come back home, and then you take your bath at the end of the day. If the water coming through your body, over your body, on, in, the sink, uh, in, the, in the tub, you look at it, and the, and the thing is dirty. Why? Because you are in the world. And that physical illustration tells you, as you go in the world, the things we hear, even without wanting to hear, the things we see, even without wanting to see, and the things that come across our ears, our, our mouth, and everything, is defiling. That's why the Lord is saying, even without active participation in the world, the world has a defiling effect. That's why it's saying now, if you now go actively into the world, and you are part of them, and you listen to their music, and you, you respond to their music, and you do what they do, and you dress the way they dress, and follow the language they follow, and go through all their merriments and everything, there you are completely and totally defiled. That's why it says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. It tells us, look at the defilement now. I'm reading to you from, uh, I'm reading from Second Peter chapter 2. Second Peter chapter 2. And it tells us what the world looks like. That's why it says, come out of that thing, because that world will defile you. In Second Peter chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 20, it says, for if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, the pollutions in the world, if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord Jesus, of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome the latter end is worse than their beginning. That's the reason it says, love not the world. Because if you get involved with the lust of the flesh, with the lust of the eyes, and with the pride of life. And then you become actively involved with the people of the world and the pollutions of the world, the perversions of the world, and the preoccupations of the world. is saying that the latter age will be worse than the beginning. That's why in the love of God, in the goodness of God, and because of your joy, because of your eternal interest, that's why he's saying love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Uh, look at verse 21. It says in verse 21, for it had been better 
better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they had known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. It says in verse 22, but it is happened unto them according to the true a proverb. The dog is turned to his own vomit again and the so the swine, the pig that was washed to a wallowing in the mire. And look at Isaiah chapter 24. Isaiah chapter 24. Here we're reading from verse 5 telling us the condition of the world, the defilement of the, the dirt in the world, the perversions in the world. And you see because of this defilement and you have become a child of God, he doesn't want you to be involved with the defilement of the world. That's why he said, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Isaiah chapter 24 and verse 5. The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof. That's it. And you don't want to be defiled because those who expect the coming of the Lord and they want to be ready when he comes. He that has this opinion purifies himself even as Christ is pure. If you want to remain pure, you see here it says the earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof because they have transgressed the laws and changed the ordinances and broken the everlasting covenant. And that's why you don't want to be involved with those uh, defilement in what the defilement in the world. We're looking at Second Peter chapter one. Second Peter chapter one. We're reading from verse three and verse four. According as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and to virtue. Look at verse 4, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these, listen to this, ye might be partakers of the divine nature. Look at this, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through loss. There's corruption in the world. There's defilement in the world. There is sin in the world. And you don't want to be actively involved with that. You want to preserve yourself. That's why he's saying, with well, the grace of God in you, he wants you to keep away from that defilement. Number one, I spoke about the description or the definition. Number two, we spoke about the defilement. Number three now, the damnation of the world. Why is the Lord saying, love not the world? Because if you are like them, when their judgment comes, it will affect you. And because God doesn't want you to perish all the world, that's why he's saying, love not the world. There is the damnation of the world. Let's look at Psalm 9, Psalm 9, and we're reading from verse 8. Psalm 9, we're looking at verse 8. And then we'll move down to verse 17. Psalm 9, we're reading here from verse 8. In Psalm 9, verse 8, it says, And he shall judge the world in righteousness, and he shall minister judgment to the people in uprightness. He's saying damnation is coming for the world. Judgment is coming for the world. And if you happen to be part of them, and you are with them, when that judgment day comes, then you are judged with them. But because of the love of God for you, because he does not want you to be damned and condemned with the world, that's why he said, love not the world. Look at verse 17, see what will happen to them. When it says, the world will, will be judged by God. In verse 17 it says, and the wicked shall be turned into hell. I pray you will not be there. Are you there? I said, you will not be there. It says, and then the wicked shall be turned to hell, and all the nations that forget God. All the nations that forget God. What makes them to forget God? Because they listen to Satan. They listen to the prince of this world. They listen to the influence and the inspiration and the power and the authority of the prince of the world. They say they don't want to, any, to do anything with God. And then they take their cue. They take instruction. They take counseling. And they take all their practice from the prince of the world. That's why God is saying don't be part of them. Don't be part of them. So that 
you will not be condemned and judged toward the world. Isaiah chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 11. Isaiah chapter 13, and we're reading here from verse 11. The world is going to come under serious judgment, devastating judgment. Isaiah chapter 13 verse 11 and i will punish the world for their evil you see that i will punish the world for their evil don't be part of that evil system and don't be part of their fashion don't be part of their entertainment don't be part of their drunkenness don't be part of their hard drugs and all those evil things they do and don't be part of their hypocrisy and craft don't be part of their fraud all the ways they follow because god says i will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity and i will cause the arrogancy of the proud you remember that as a pride of life i will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible and uh, he tells us in james chapter 4 james chapter 4 we're reading from verse 4 james chapter 4 and we're looking at uh, verse 4 uh, because if you now if you join the people of the world when their judgment comes then you're going to receive the same punishment it tells us in james chapter 4 verse 4 ye adulterers and adulteresses strong language strong language ye adulterers and adulteresses it says know ye not the friendship of the world is enmity with god whosoever Therefore, I, I told you this is not a denominational thing. It is not because, you know, some people say because, you know, they are in deeper life. That's why they don't, uh, you know, drink with the world. They don't uh, socialize with the world. And they don't uh, go to all the secret societies of the, you know, highly placed people. They don't go there. Not because we're deeper life. It's good we're deeper life. Do you want to be shallow? Anybody likes to be shallow there? I like to be deeper in Christ higher in Christ and you know go further in Christ I don't want to be superficial so that when the judgment come I will not be there how about you look at verse 4 it says therefore ye adulterers and adulteresses know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God whosoever therefore anybody anywhere in any generation whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world will be the enemy of God. I pray you will not be an enemy of God in Jesus' name. Amen. The world then, as we have seen, uh, you know, the world means uh, the system of the world directed by Satan. And the purpose of Satan is to defile, is to destroy, and is to damn the soul. And the devil uses all those things of the world that is now called worldliness to defile, to deaden, and to damn the inhabitants of the world. Hence the command of the Lord, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. The Lord is giving us this command because of our own interest for our preservation for our eternal happiness and glory that's the reason why god has commanded us love not the world and by the grace of god in the strength of the lord will be obedient to the lord in jesus name and now we come to point number two point number two this is uh, the gradual process of corruption by the world the gradual process of corruption by the world you see the devil the devil doesn't just come like that in a single blow and take somebody into the world he goes through a gradual process and uh, the lord will help us so that this uh, gradual process of the devil will not catch you will not catch me will not catch us in jesus name uh, let's look at them one by one. We're looking at uh, 1 John chapter 2 and we're looking at verse 16. 1 John chapter 2 and we're reading here from verse 16. It says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father. Even uh, just that, not of the Father. If you're a parent, you're a father, you're a mother, you have little children, and your little child is uh, going out, and you say, well, if somebody gives you this, don't accept that because it's not of me. 
I didn't send them. And uh, if you have uh, somebody who knows about the danger, the danger ahead, and then he tells you, don't open that thing. Don't get it, that thing. Don't, don't take that thing. If the Lord is telling you that because he loves you, he says, that's not of me. That's not of the Father. That's not of Christ. If you're a real child of God, you say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I'm not going to get involved with that. It's for your preservation. It's for your happiness and it's for your eternal joy because it says all those things in the world, they are not of the Father but is of the world. Let's look at them one by one. Number one, the lost of the flesh. We're looking at Second Peter chapter 2. Second Peter chapter 2 and we're reading from verse 10. Second Peter chapter 2 and we're reading from verse 10. In Second Peter chapter 2, see what the word of the Lord is saying concerning this lust of the flesh. It says, but chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness. The lust of uncleanness. That when the Lord created us, he created us to have some desires. Those desires, ordinarily, they need, they're good, they're neutral. The hunger we experience that's good. And the thirst we experience, that's good. And sometimes relationship between the man and the woman is a healthy desire. So when you get married, you'll be able to have children. That's why God put those desires there. But you see, the devil will want you to satisfy the hunger in a bad way, in a satanic way. He'll want you to satisfy the thirst in a satanic way. He'll say, do this and do this. That's what he told Jesus Christ. Are you not hungry? It is a normal, natural desire that were hungry. But he wanted Jesus to satisfy that hunger in a wrong way. That, and Jesus said, it is written. I'm not going to do that. The same thing, the passion in the body. The attraction between the man and the woman. The Lord has created that. He has given us that so that we inside the marriage will have all that he wants us to have. But the devil wants you to use that outside marriage. That's why he's saying the lust of the flesh. Go look at that verse again. You understand it better now. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness. And they despise government and presumptuous are they self-willed and they are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. What that means is, uh, you know, whoever is on the side of the Lord and is talking against their passion and talking against their lust of the flesh, they, they will oppose that individual. That's why sometimes uh, some of us preachers of holiness will come under fire and heat and opposition. And you too, because we are preachers together. Or what do you preach? I said, what do you preach? You know, sometimes they come against us because we are preaching holiness, but don't mind, don't mind. It's their father instigating them, and we are obeying our father. This same word, we're going to keep on preaching in Jesus' name. Look at them in verse 14. Look at them. It says, having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls and hearts, they have exercised with covetous practices. It says, they are cursed children. I will not be under a curse. You will not be under a curse in Jesus' name. And the loss of the flesh, not the loss of the eyes. The loss of the eyes. Do you remember the story of Lot? There was a disagreement between Lot and Lot's herdsmen and Abraham's Lot's men. And then Abraham called Lot and said, Please, we are brethren, don't let us fight. And uh, shouldn't we say that to ourselves, even today, as brethren, as those who are washed in the blood of the Lamb, and we belong to the same family of God? You know, sometimes we have disagreement on non-essentials, on things we shouldn't even be talking about when you get to heaven. And then we get through those pearly gates because we're getting there in Jesus' name. Somebody there said, we're getting there. When we get to heaven and then we look back, it may be we're looking back 50 years from that time, 20 years from that time when nothing happened. And then we thought, we think about what we have disagreements on. 
what we opposed each other for, what we threw stones at each other for, will be ashamed of ourselves. How could I have any kind of disagreement with my brother, with my sister, for such a non-essential? Lord did not understand. But Abraham understood because Abraham was looking for another city that is built by God, whose foundation and the maker is God. And then he said, Lord, don't let us fight, please. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. Choose whichever you want. I'll take the rest. And Lord said, isn't that something good? I'm going to have the first choice. Here comes the lost of the eyes. And he looked at everything well watered. And he said, I choose this. Abraham said, that's all right. And Abraham went to the other part. And he built his tent near Sodom. Eventually, he got to the gate of Sodom. Eventually, he lived in Sodom. Why? Because the place was well watered, as if it were the garden of God. That's the lost of the eyes. And eventually, everything was totally destroyed. When fire came on Sodom and Gomorrah, not a single, of, a single one of those such men escaped. All his cattle, everything was burnt. He didn't take anything out. All the herdsmen, they were all burnt. He even lost his wife because the wife looked back and became a pillar of salt. That's what it will do. The lost of the eyes, wanting to grab that thing and hold that thing. That's why you are praying the prayer we read about in Psalm 119. Psalm 119, I'm reading from verse 37. Psalm 119, we're looking at verse 37 119 verse 37 it tells us in this verse 119 verse 37 turn away mine eyes from beholding vanity if Lord had known about this kind of prayer and had prayed this prayer it would have saved him saved his family saved the herdsmen and saved all the cattle saved all his property turn away mine eyes from beholding vanity and quicken thou me in thy ways you know sometimes uh, you have to uh, pray this kind of prayer if you're a student on our campuses today as you, you know you're a lady and you see all those uh, girls and uh, the way they appear and that's the world that's the world what the lord wants us to cover they want to expose and uh, sometimes uh, you're a young man and uh, you see all those uh, young men on the campus and the pride of life if you smoke this if you inject or say well, you did you'll be high and these people say they'll be high when they take that thing eventually we'll find them in the gutter and they are vomiting and they're sleeping in that uh, vomit i thought they said that if they do this they'll be high the gutter is that being high and then sometimes uh, you know you read the papers and it says they mix this and mix this and they drink everything and then eventually they become dizzy before they take them to the hospital they are dead they might be level you know level four level that and that and they are gone and life comes to an end and then they go to meet uh, you know the god who will judge them on the other side i pray you'll not be like that in jesus name that's why it says as we go through the world you'll see a lot of things so hear a lot of their music as you you know sometimes uh, if you, even if you don't have a television at home you have all those screens on the street and you know sometimes there are people that will stand there on the street and the car is coming they don't mind at all they are dancing away their life and everything right on the street there it's like the whole thing has gone inside them some people have no purpose in life anymore no goal in life anymore all they are looking for the lost of the flesh and the loss of the eyes and the pride of life i pray that the lord will turn your eyes away from that and sometimes when if you maybe your relative is doing a you know marriage ceremony and then they, you know, they invite you because it's your maybe your relative. You see, I'm going to get there just to honor them because it's my so and so that is having the marriage. And you get there and dressing you never saw in your life before. You know, they slash one at the back, they slash one in the bottom. And as they are walking like this, you are seeing what, in fact, sometimes you have to close your eyes. That, uh, you know, I don't want to see that kind of thing. It's the world. Who is giving them all this? Who is giving them all this kind of, uh, you know, things we never saw many years ago? The prince of the power of the air. And once you buy into that, you become part of the system. I will not be in that system. 
Because you belong to another world. You belong to another kingdom. And because you belong to another kingdom, that's why the Lord is going to save you from all that in Jesus' name. Number three is the pride of life. The pride of life. And look at Psalm 10. I'm reading from verse 4. Psalm 10. And we're looking at verse 4. Psalm 10. We're reading from verse 4. It tells us in verse 4. In verse 4 it says, The wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. God is not in all his thoughts. If you go to the market, let's say you want to buy clothing. And then you want to buy those things that are ready made. And you pick up this, you see, <laughs> I don't think I can put on this one. Then they, you put on that, you, you would take this, just, I don't think I can buy this one. And then the person selling will say, what's happening to you? Where are you coming from? All this, you cannot make your choice. And then you say, I'm a Christian. Okay, I understand. The people who sold those things, they didn't have God in mind. So if you come here and you are bringing doctrine, you are bringing, you are evaluating what you are going to buy from here with Bible. The people who sold that, they didn't have Bible in mind. They didn't have God in mind. That's what it says here. All they had in mind, how do I look to the world? How do I look to, you know, guys like me? How do I look to this and that? That's what they have in mind. That's what you don't fit in. And I pray you'll never fit in. And then you say, okay, give me an ordinary piece of that. Go and sew it for my style because I have God in my thoughts. And I have God in my planning. And therefore, I'm going to sow it in such a way that this will be pleasing unto God. But if you're looking at them and you want to take it just like they've done it, they don't have God in mind. It's the pride of life. And I pray that the Lord will preserve you in Jesus' name. Well, eventually, Nebuchadnezzar understood that because all the time was living his life, what controlled him? The pride of life. The pride of life. Hey, look at um, Daniel. In Daniel chapter 4, Daniel chapter 4, and you will see the attitude of, um, of uh, Nebuchadnezzar as well as the language of Nebuchadnezzar. We're looking at Daniel chapter 4. As we look at Daniel chapter 4, we're reading from verse 27. In verse 27, wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee. And then it says that you break off thy sins by righteousness and thy iniquities by showing mercy to the poor, if it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. And all this came to upon uh, the king Nebuchadnezzar. Look at verse 29. At the end of 12 months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. And the king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of my kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? Do you find God there? No, God is not in his thoughts. He did it for himself, for his majesty. And there are people like that, they live their lives just for themselves. The God who created them, they are forgotten. The God who has saved them, they are forgotten. The God who sent Jesus Christ to die for them on the cross of Calvary, they are forgotten. While the word was in the, in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O king Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, thy kingdom is departed from thee. In his own case, there was a chance for him to repent. Other people will get to this point and then God will say, Thou fool, this night your soul shall be required of thee. And then of whose will all this is be that you have amassed together. The Lord is telling us then that we need to understand that this world is a corrupting world. The world corrupts the people's minds and corrupts them by a gradual process. It begins with the introduction of innocent things and then some insignificant things, apparently similar insignificant things will come and then some doubtful things will come along influencing their mind until they slide into 
the inexcusable, inexcusable. How does the devil do this? Let me show you the steps because uh, the devil might come tomorrow or any time. You'll know his secret, you'll overcome him. And you'll not slide into the things of the world in Jesus' name. How does he get people started in corrupting them, captivating them, contaminating them until they become condemned? Number one, the cares of the world. The cares of the world. You see, there are people, they care for the things of the world. How I look to the world, how I'm acceptable to the world, how the world will appreciate me, and what the world will think of my appearance and my dressing as I'm going out. The cares of this life. And the things they buy, the equipment and the furniture and everything, they are not buy just for the sake of usefulness. They are buy so that if a so and so comes to my house, how would they feel? How would they feel that I'm exalted in life? I've got this, I've got this, and the cares of life will sneak in into their lives. That's the beginning of getting, becoming part of the world. Look at Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. Here we're reading from verse 19, verse 18. Mark chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 18. And these are they which are sown among the thorns, such as hear the word and the cares of this world. These are the words of Jesus. That's how the devil begins. He says, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of all the things entering in. They were not there before. Entering in. It says, it choke the world, and it becometh unfruitful. The cares of this life. Are you thinking about your own soul? That's why Jesus said, What shall it profit a man? Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. I'm reading here from verse 36. In Mark chapter 8, verse 36, Jesus said, For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? It begins with the cares of this world. Number two is companionship of the world. Companionship of the world. When you are going to the people of the world, teach me how you do this. Teach me how you do this. I want to learn this from you. And then you are taking them as your role model. Maybe for those uh, who watch their television, they have their heroes. The heroes in the world. And then you become their companions and you are looking at them. You are trying to copy them. And that companionship of the world is what happened to... Let me show you the man. We're looking at this in 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, and we're looking at verse 10. This was a companion of Paul the Apostle. But the holiness teaching of Paul the Apostle was too much for him. And the non-conformity to the world of Paul the Apostle was too much for him. And the devotion, consecration, dedication of Paul the Apostle was too much for him. I was told in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, for demons have forsaken me, having lodged this present world. For demons have forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto where? Thessalonica. There was a church in Thessalonica, but he wouldn't go there. He has departed unto Thessalonica. He knew all that Paul the apostle was teaching, but he wouldn't go to that church because those, that church, they were following after us and following after the Lord. They are following after what Paul the apostle had taught. And Paul the apostle had to send Timothy there because his companion had become a companion of the world. Number one, the care of the world. Number two, companionship of the world. Number three, conformity to the world. Conformity to the world. When, uh, you know, you, when you dress and then you call a worldly woman, is this all all right, why are you asking her? She doesn't have the same spirit as you have. She doesn't have the same mindset as you have. She doesn't have the salvation you have. She doesn't have the desire to please the Lord that you should have as a Christian. You are a child of God, and then you ask an unbeliever, is this all right? You mean, is this all right to our kind of people? And when, you, when she says, well, it, that's not all right. If you come out like this, they won't know how rich you are. They won't know how popular you are. They won't know how great you are. And then you are now 
you are going to adjust not according to the Bible, according to that woman of the world, according to that man of the world. And that means conformity from the cares of the world to the companionship of the world and to the conformity of the world. And that's exactly what the Bible has told us not to do. It tells us in Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 2. Romans chapter 12, and I'm reading here from verse 2. And you begin to find out your style. Is it the style of the world? You know, sometimes you see some of uh, these, uh, you know, our sisters. And if you really want to know the conviction of uh, those sisters, uh, follow them to the time they are doing wedding somewhere. And then you see them, you say, that cannot be sister so-and-so. Looks like her. I don't think it can be her. And then you get there, and then she greets you and says, uh, good afternoon, bro. Are you sister so-and-so? Oh, yes. Are you like this? Uh -uh. We came for a function here. That function doesn't have God in it. That function, we shouldn't bring God here. We mustn't bring Christianity here. We mustn't bring, uh, you know, Christian standard here because this one is of the world. What's that? That's conformity to the world. When they're doing some of these, their celebrations, you follow them. They forget everything they ever learned. And because of the cares of the world, the companionship of the world, and then the conformity to the world, well, thank God. God, the blood of Jesus will cleanse us and will change us completely and will not be like the world anymore in Jesus' name. We're looking at Romans chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 2. It says in chapter 12, verse 2, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the re renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. The next step in that uh, process is contamination by the world. Corruption by the world. Contamination by the world by the world. I'm looking at uh, Second Peter chapter 2 and we're looking at verse 20. Corruption by the world or contamination by the world. For if after they have escaped from the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. The final uh, thing there will be the condemnation with the world. Condemnation with the world. If you start and you don't stop that trend, cares of the world, and then companionship of the world, and then conformity to the world, contamination by the world, if you don't stop and be cleansed by the blood of the Lamb, and have a change and have a transformation, the thing that will eventually happen will be condemnation with the world. John chapter 3. In John chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 19. John chapter 3. And we're reading from verse 19. John chapter 3, verse 19. In verse 19 it says, And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Their deeds were evil. And they didn't have any mind of repentance, any mind to change, any mind to come to know the Lord, any, any mind to repent. Like I can just see that if you're a real child of God, and we're you know, having this story today, and you don't want to perish with the world, and it says, love not the world, none of the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in it for all the things that are in the world. The lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, they are not of the Father. Every one of us studying the word of God should go back home and check up our wardrobe. Is this of the Father or is this of the world? Those things were keeping somewhere that you cannot wear to church. Whatever you cannot wear to church, anywhere you wear that church, that means God is not in your thought. I don't understand how somebody will have to will say, I'm a Christian. And he says, this is so good. I cannot wear it to church. This is so wonderful. I cannot wear it to church. But when there's a special occasion, 
to glorify the devil when it's a special occasion to rejoice with the people of the world and the majority of people that will be there they'll be people of the world and i want to match them i want to conform with them i want to look like them therefore i'm reserving that I don't know whether that person is a Christian or not. If you're a Christian, you want the best you have should be when you come to worship God. And the things you have that you are happy about should be when you come to worship God. But if the best you think in your mind is not good for church, but is good for the world, I'm not sure you have the conversion we're talking about. But when that change has come, you will say, I'm a child of God, and uh, what interests me is my worship of God and meeting with the people of God. You know, some people are coming to the Bible study and they wear something that is so shabby, you cannot even tell whether uh, they're interested in the Bible study or not. But when they are going to the place, they count important. Uh huh. This one is not important. So in the Bible, it's not important. Jacob said, this is the gate to heaven. That one is not important to them. But when they are going to the important place, then they wear those things. Uh, we need to change. God will help us. I said, God will help us. I don't want to say, but let me say, you know, sometimes when people die, after they have died, and now you have to pack their things, and then you are looking, say, watch. So, Brother so and so at all this inside here, now he's gone. And he's not there to protect it for you not to see it. So, sister so and so at all this, when she was alive, and now she's gone. And because we have to pack all things and all that, we're now discovering. Don't let us discover that after you have gone. Go back home and look at this. Look at the word of God and say, I'm not going to allow this world to suck me up. I'm not going to allow the world to defile me or to destroy me. Before I die, I'm going to check up so that after I have gone, anybody that comes to my house and they are helping to pack this and this and clean it up for another person to occupy, they will not see anything. They will say, we're not sure where this person has gone. Although we are, you know, celebrating and all that, but we're not sure where it has gone because look at all this. We must check up everything and clean up everything before that final day. You will do it. I said you will do it. Because you know, I didn't just come to teach Bible study for head knowledge. I came to teach the Bible study so that it will affect my life, affect your life, and then we go back home, and then all that God wants us to do and to achieve, we're going to do and achieve in Jesus' name. I come now to point number three, and I'm reading from 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse... 17. First John chapter 2. We're reading from verse 17. In verse 17 it says, And the world passeth away, and the laws thereof. But it says, He that doeth the will of God abideth forever. He that doeth the will of God abideth forever. There are three things here. Number one, the passing away of the evil world. The passing away of the evil world. This world is going to pass away. All the things in this world will melt away with fervent heat. Actually, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. I'm reading here from the first part of verse 35. It says, heaven and earth shall pass away. The world that now is will pass away. All the gold there, all the silver there, all the buildings there, all the so-called good, good things there, all the things that people waste their life and, uh, you know, take um, everything. Uh, they, they will not serve God. All this, all they are reaching for and going after, everything will melt away. Look at Second Peter chapter 3, verse 10. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the element shall melt with fervent heat the earth also and the works the works that are therein shall be burnt up 
such a day where would you be and what will you have left number one the passing away of this evil world number two the permanence of the endless world the permanence of the endless world we're looking at um, luke chapter 20 Luke chapter 20, the world that will remain forever. That's the next world. That's the world to come. That's uh, the glorious uh, heavenly, heavenly place we're going. In uh, Luke chapter 20, I'm reading from verse 35. Luke chapter 20, verse 35. But they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world. That's another world. That's another kingdom. That's another, that's the heavenly place. They that shall be counted worthy, are counted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead. They neither marry nor are given in marriage, neither can they die anymore. For they, for they are equal unto the angels and are the children of God, being the children of resurrection, will be equal to the angels and will live forever and ever. And we're looking at Luke chapter 21. I'm reading here from verse 34. Uh, seeing that all those things shall be so. It's telling us that take heed, it is Luke chapter 21 verse 34, and take heed to your Sales, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with suffering and drunkenness. Let's go be like those people that are drunk in the world. You know, they have a certificate that doesn't even have any job attached to it yet. They want to celebrate and waste millions of naira. They build, um, you know, a house that they have not even finished paying for all the, all the money they borrowed to build that house. They want to gather people together and, uh, you know, celebrate and do this and that. All that is the way of the world. And it's saying we should take it less at any time. A house be overcharged with suffering and drunkenness. And it says, and the care cares of this life and the cares of this life it's like we're becoming like the people some people i don't i don't want to say we because i'll never be like the world i said i'll never be like the world you know why some believer wants to be like the world if this happen and i don't do this what will they say who are the day the world the world the world they're so conscious of the people of the world what will they say it doesn't matter we're not part of them we're not in their group, and we're not in their company. We're not in their society. We're not uh, their colleagues. They, have, they are down there. We are up there. Because our lives are hid with Christ in God. And because of that, we have another world, another kingdom. We're not thinking of them. Whatever the word of God will allow, that's what we'll do. Any situation, any time. Not what will they think. Those day, they don't matter. It says over here, let the cares of this life and then will come upon you and so that day comes upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come upon all them that dwell on the face of the world of the earth. And then it says, watch ye therefore, I pray your watch. I said, I pray your watch. Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. I come back to for a second, First John chapter 2. The possessors of the eternal world. The possessors of the eternal world. We're looking at First, first John chapter 2 verse 17. It says, and this and the world passes away, and the loss thereof. But he that doeth the will of God. Who are those? He that doeth the will of God. God bless you. Those who are saved. Those who are born again. You cannot do the will of God except you are born again. If the depravity is still there in the heart, the defilement is still there in your life, if the magnet that attracts people to the world is still there and the blood of Jesus has not uprooted that and taken that away, you cannot do the will of God from the heart like it's saying here. But it says when you are born again and then you move on, you are sanctified and there's nothing of this world there's nothing of this life that is holding you down. And you're not looking at, I want their praises, I want their appreciation, I want them to say I am this, I am that. And you're not you know, trying to show anything to anybody. All you want to show is that 
I am a child of God. And of course, I'm a member of deeper life. You know, there are people, they are, they, when they, they are going for what they call function, occasion, as they call it, they'll say, well, if I appear like this, they'll be asking me, do you go to deeper life? So I don't want them to ask me that kind of question. So I'm going to be like this, don't, so they don't know I am deep in Christ. I am deeper in the Lord. I'll be ashamed of anybody like that. If you are a child of God, show that you are a child of God. Anywhere you are, let them identify you with the people. You believe what we're teaching here about salvation? about sanctification, about holiness. You believe that everything we're teaching here is necessary to take you to heaven and that's why you're in deeper life. Let others know so that your life will convict them and they will know that this is not the way but this is the way what ye in it. Anywhere I go, if somebody is asking about deeper life on side, before he lands, I say, look at me, I'm number one there. And they say, you are, I say, then I mention my name, oh, then they say, they change their topic, and everything will change. You'll be like that. Like father, like son, like father, like daughter. You'll be like that in Jesus' name. So that anywhere you are, you'll be able to stand, and you'll stand firm, and you'll say, this is where I belong. He that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Are you there? Will abide forever. The Lord has spoken to us to correct our lives and our heart and our actions and everything. And everything the Lord has told us tonight, we are going to obey in Jesus' name. Love not the world. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. Tell the Lord that you give your heart, you give your life to the Lord afresh. Say, Lord, doesn't matter to me what the people of the world think. I want to love the Lord. I want to serve the Lord. I want to be like the Lord Jesus Christ himself. The world hated him. Why do you want the world that hated Jesus Christ to love you and to appreciate you? Say, Lord, I'm going to follow you. And if there are things you need to change in your life, in your language, in the kind of music you listen to, in the kind of uh, programs you watch, in the kinds of uh, society and people you are moving with, and the kind of company you are interacting with, you need to tell the Lord, oh Lord, I see this, I see this, I see that. I'm going to follow the word of the Lord. Love not the world, none are the things that are in the world. If anyone, if any man, if any woman loves the world, the love of the Father is not in it for all the things that are in the world. The lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. They are not of the Father, but they are of the world. And this world passeth away. But he, but she, that doeth the will of God will abide forever.